In the next few minutes, I want to look at a problem that afflicts many in their trading career. It afflicts many investors throughout the life cycle of all their investments. It pertains to every investment. It doesn't just pertain to equities. This is a problem that catches everybody. The problem is simply this. The past is not the future. What you see in the past might not necessarily reoccur in the future in the way you think it will. Alternatively, we can also ask the question, why is Wall Street made up of gibbons? The answer to this question, which is very, very important, will become apparent. The topic of this little piece was prompted by this graphic, which I saw on the Wall Street Journal. It looks at the comparison between investing $10,000 in Microsoft and $10,000 in Apple over the past 10 years. As you can see, Apple is the standout winner. Your $10,000 has grown to over $667,000, whereas Microsoft has barely given you a positive return. Your 10K has become 12, which is an unacceptable return for 10 years. So quite clearly, there is a disparity over this time period between these two companies. This prompted me to look a little bit further and to see whether this relationship held and whether the relationship could actually tell me anything. And in particular, tell me about that delineation that a company experiences when it moves from innovator to a mature company that dominates its marketplace. I went back in time and I took both of these companies back to the 1980s to look at what would happen if I was a peanut and I had simply bought either of these companies and held them forever. The interesting thing is, is that during its growth phase, during the 90s, up until the tech wreck, Microsoft performs extraordinarily well. One dollar invested has a terminal value of over $600. Unfortunately, since the tech wreck, since the year 2000, the past 12 years have been a bust. The stock has effectively gone sideways. You could argue that this is because the stock is mature and the stock is not an innovator. It is not, as they would say, a disruptor of its industry. Apple shows a different picture. Apple's growth only took off from about 2006 with the introduction of the iPhone and later the introduction of the iPad. Up until that point in time, Apple was a complete dud. It was simply going nowhere. So we have a disparate segment of the life cycle for both these companies when we compare them. What we need to do is look at them both during their growth phase and see whether they are comparable and to see whether that tells us anything about what happens with price and what happens with the psychology of price over time. We get this when we compare them over their growth phase. They look remarkably similar. Both have long bases, long gestation periods, and then they take off. And this is to be expected because the psychology of booms, irrespective of whether it is a boom confined to an individual stock, from 2006 onwards is identical to a boom in technology stocks that spans the latter part of the 20th century. The psychology between the two is identical. There is nothing that is different between them. This is profoundly interesting to me because it tells me that when I go back and look at Microsoft that the future, the here and now, is not the past because the immediate past for Microsoft is one of churn. It's one of range trading for a decade. The history before that is one of inordinate growth in share value and value of the company to investors. So the question becomes, what happens to companies after they've experienced this explosive growth? Well, the interesting thing as we're about to find is that they tend to look like Microsoft. Now that doesn't mean that Apple will eventually look like Microsoft where it will do nothing but churn. 
having gone as far as it would go. The question to me, in part, is why does this occur? And the answer is really quite simple. It occurs because all investors are identical. Crowd behaviour has not changed since humans began to get together and argue over the value of things, and it will never change. Our technology will change, the way we see the world will change, but our reaction to the world will never change as a group. We will always be the same. So it doesn't matter what instrument it is, it will always look, during its boom, like Apple did during its boom, like Microsoft did during its boom. But this raises an additional question to me, and I posed this at the beginning. Why on earth is Wall Street full of lower-end primates? What is it about this industry that caused them, and all the Apple fanboys, to fall into the trap of saying that Apple was going straight to $1,000? Well, what caught them was the assumption that what was happening yesterday would also happen today, and that markets were perfectly linear and repeatable. They're not perfectly linear. Their macro cycles repeat, but they're definitely not linear. You can't get caught up thinking, well, it went up yesterday, the day before, and for five years beforehand, so if I buy it, it will go up for five years from whence I bought it. The past is not the future. They're very, very different. To illustrate this, take a look at these charts, and there are two. There is this one, and there is this one. They look remarkably different. But here's the trick. I generated these randomly, and I changed one variable, one what they call seed condition, by the tiniest of amounts. And that change has given me this dramatically different scenario. So small changes in what is happening can dramatically affect the outcome you might expect. Stocks don't run on tram tracks. They get caught in the ebb and flow of human psychology. And as we all know, humans are irrational and their thinking is somewhat lazy. One change, one alteration, one shock factor, one little difference can produce a dramatically different outcome than what you're expecting. Consider the fact that when I entered broking in the early 80s, everyone was talking about Japan's century, how Japan would dominate the latter half of the 20th century and through the 21st century. Japanese business books were everywhere, and every peanut doing a business course went out and bought a copy of The Art of War by Sun Tzu, not realising that Sun Tzu is actually Chinese, not Japanese. But if you're doing a business degree, small facts like that really don't count. For a while, it seemed as if that was going to be true. In the period from 1984 through to 89, the Nikkei went up nearly fourfold. It had extraordinary growth. And post the 1987 crash that decimated markets in the Western world, the Nikkei went up 50%. Now, our markets were desperately trying to recover from the belting they got during 1987, and we were only just managing to do this. But Japanese markets were barreling ahead. So it seemed as if all the predictions, all the prognostication about the Japanese century were true. Unfortunately, the future is not the same as the past. And this is the Nikkei post-1989. The Nikkei has been in an extended bear market for a generation. You can see the 1989 high, you can see where it is now. It has suffered an enormous drawdown. And this bear market has been unrelenting and unremitting because the future is not the past. They're very, very different. Just because the Nikkei went up fourfold from 84 to 89 did not mean that from 89 to 93 it was going to do the same thing something else might happen and you have to be aware of what that something else might be or at least awake to the possibility because trading is about planning for all eventualities. This is the Ford Motor Car Company and it is the Ford Motor Car Company from 1957 through to the early 1980s. 
This is a generational bear market in a stock. We saw one in the Nikkei. This is in a stock. If you'd been involved with Ford during this period, your worldview might be that Ford is never going to go up again, that it's simply been going sideways for three decades. How could it possibly ever go up? In the space of three years, it doubled. And that's because something changed, a small change in condition, a small change in investor sentiment, something altered to make this happen. This question can also be posed to the people who ran Kodak. Those geniuses who actually invented the digital camera, but who the first time they saw one in a phone were probably like my father when he was talking about genes. They probably said, that will never catch on and that will never last. Unfortunately, it did. In the space of a few years, Kodak went from being worth nearly $100 to being worth a fraction of a cent, simply because something changed, something altered, that they were not prepared to deal with in any way, shape or form. The past is not the future in trading. The future will have its own pathway, its own trajectory. And unfortunately, traders get locked into believing that because this happened in the past for someone else, it must happen for me in exactly the same way. Unfortunately, that's not the way the world works.